thank you very much for coming along to, I think it's the um, penultimate session of the uh, festival. And were any of you here last year for this particular, this rock and roll politics event? Um, well, if you remember then, we all predicted, for example, that if the referendum was lost, Alex Hammond would stay on as leader of the SNP, and anyway, everything was completely wrong. Um, we're going to do something different this year because politics has changed. I'm doing a, a show every day at the Edinburgh Festival, I've just come from it, where I explore three mysteries of British politics. Um, things that have changed over the last year that demand further investigation. And at the Edinburgh Festival, you must all come along. I sort of partly acquire the role of Hercule Poirot in investigating the mysteries of British politics. But my impersonation of Hercule Poirot is so bad, I'm not going to do it for you tonight. It sounds like Harold Wilson when I do Hercule Poirot. <laughs> so I'm just going to raise the three mysteries that I address at the Edinburgh Festival. I'm going to ask our brilliant panel, Mink Campbell and Yasmin Alibi Brown, to explore them. And I won't explore them. You'll have to come to Edinburgh for that. But what I will do is outline to you the three mysteries that I explore in rock and roll politics at the festival. Mystery number one, the rise of Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> now, if any of you who were here a year ago <laughs> said to me that the next leader of the Labour Party would be Jeremy Corbyn, I would offer to go and drown in the brewery downstairs. It seemed impossible. But in politics, the weirdest things happen. Why? Why is this figure <coughs> about to be leader of the opposition? We need to crack that mystery tonight. Mystery number two. The SNP lose the referendum and then sweep Scotland in a way that is just extraordinary. I asked Neil Kinnock for his explanation as to why the SNP had swept Scotland. And I said to Neil Kinnock, the former leader of the Labour Party, could you give me, what is the what's your forensic analysis of the SNP rise? And he looked at me and just said, Christ is bloody biblical. And that was it. <laughs> Maybe Ming and Yasmin could give a more forensic explanation. And for my explanation, you have to go to the Edinburgh Festival. But before we explore these things with the panel, the third one is why all those opinion polls were wrong about the UK election. How many of you from the UK here predicted that Cameron would win an overall majority? I don't believe you. <laughs> I'll tell you why. Everyone I meet now, you know, there are a lot of pompous columnists in London. I know they're very different in Scotland. Um, but in London, I keep on, I bet Ming and Yasmin, it's been the same down at Westminster. Oh, of course, deep down, I knew the Conservatives would win an overall majority. And I'd say to these pompous columnists, but you told me that you thought Miliband would be Prime Minister. Yes, but deep down, I knew it would be Cameron. <laughs> well, it was very deep down. But anyway, well done if you did predict that, you prophetic souls, because all the polls suggested something else. And that's what I will also explore with our panel and all of you, because there'll be a chance for questions. I'll just very briefly... In a few minutes, I won't reflect on the rise of Nicola because you've seen her here and you've seen Alex. Um, but I'm going to ask the panel about that and about Cameron and Osborne. I'll just provide a few couple of clues as to why I think Corbyn has risen so far. And that is, and then I'll ask what, what the panel think and all of you. When the Labour leadership contest began after this traumatic defeat, which I can tell you for sure Miliband hadn't expected. He got a call on the night of the election from a pollster saying, Ed, I know you've been superstitious about thinking about number 10. Start preparing. He and Justine sat there in this house they pretend to like in Doncaster and <laughs> planned their move into number 10. It didn't happen. He is deeply traumatised and has spent most of the post-election period in Ibiza in Australia. In a beard. Uh, in a beard, enough to fuel the trauma. 
But this is what the traumatized Labour Party had to say about it. Now, you've had Alex Salmond and Nicola Sturgeon here at the height of their self-confidence. But parties in crises behave differently to what you've experienced with Nicola and Alex this weekend. And at the start of the leadership contest, post-election, when Labour were in trauma, pre-Jeremy Corbyn, this is the kind of thing the party's great titan said. I made a note of it. And I think, as exercises in vacuous banalities, these take some beating. One of the first people to give his view of what Labour should do next after their traumatic election defeat was David Miliband, Ed's brother. He was interviewed in New York the day after the election, bottle of champagne in his hand, looking very cheerful. Um, and this was his interpretation of what had gone wrong and what Labour should do next. Here's the quote. David, champagne in hand. Isn't it sad for my brother? This is what David said. We need to own the future. We turn the page back when we should have turned the page forward. <laughs> well, that's very clear, isn't it, as a route map <laughs> to the next five years. Waffle by someone totally unsure of himself and the route for his party. This is what happens when people and parties lose. I was talking about it with Catherine early, the oscillating fortunes in British politics. One of my favourites is John Cruddus, who is Labour's great philosopher king in London and Westminster. John Cruddus for his route map towards Labour's next victory and what went wrong. John Cruddus. We need to go to some very dark places. <laughs> Sweden in the winter, you know. What does it mean? Where is it guiding this traumatised party? Another one is one of my favourites, actually, uh, from one of the candidates, who early on, the media was really pushing hard, Liz Kendall. And Liz Kendall gave an interview to The Guardian in which her clinching argument for leading the Labour Party was this. I went to school in Watford. <laughs> now, I know the bar's low for leadership, but going to school in Watford doesn't strike me as a qualification. And this is one of my favourites, and then I'm going to stop and open it to the panel. This was Tristram Hunt. Tristram Hunt, the great historian, the Labour Party moderniser, whatever that means. And this was Tristram Hunt. It was heavily briefed. He wrote an article for The Observer. And this was his peroration. We have been irrelevant. We must seem relevant. <laughs> now, do you know anyone in British politics, any leader, who has entered an election campaign saying, well, actually, I stand for total irrelevance. <laughs> I think irrelevance should be our pitch. And anyone who also wants to share my total irrelevance, join today. Of course, everyone wants to be relevant. It was meaningless. And even Tony Blair, who I know many of you won't like him, but he can communicate, and very clearly if he wants to. Tony Blair addressed those who adore him, the progress part of the Labour Party, they're called. And he walked onto a stage, oh, great to see you guys, you're yeah, fantastic actually, it's really nice to be here. That sort of mock self-deprecation. And this was Tony. Now, he can communicate, but this is his route map for Labour. Right, guys, we can win again, and we can win again next time, right? Okay. But only if our comfort zone is the future, and our values are our guide, and not our distraction. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> I've read that every day at the Edinburgh Festival, and it's totally incomprehensible. Our comfort zone is the future, our values are our guide and not our distraction. Utterly meaningless. And into that vacuum, Jeremy Corbyn surfaces with his sense of certainty and clarity. Now, Jeremy has a hero in Tony Benn. And I used to see in the early 80s Jeremy at Tony Benn's rallies. And you can see how Benite oratory, I think this mic's, I'll shout loudly, Benite oratory works 
Now, you have the vacuous phrases that I've just read out. And I used to remember Tony Benn at meetings like this saying things like this. With Jeremy Corbyn sitting in the front row looking idolatry eyed at Tony Benn. And Tony Benn would say things like this. It's quite clear to me there will be a socialist prime minister at the 1983 election. Because if you look at your history, Jesus Christ was a socialist, and that struggle that Christ worked on was developed by the levelers, moved on by the Chartists, who were profound socialists, developed further by the suffragettes, and will mean that Michael Foote is prime minister in six months' time. The whole audience cheered, and then Tony would outline his critique of British society in a way that was quite interesting in the early 80s. I remember him saying just before the royal wedding, in 1980, when Charles had that silly marriage to Diana. And Tony Benn said, and it kind of captured the commercialization of Thatcherism <coughs> very early on. And Tony Benn, with Jeremy Corbyn sitting in the front row, would say, when Charles and Diana tie the knot, they will kneel down together at the altar, and then a big banner will come down from St. Paul's, and it will say, this wedding is sponsored by Benson and Hedges. <laughs> And you saw Jeremy looking thrilled, the whole audience looking thrilled, because it pointed to a degree of change and certainty, but one that wasn't entirely clear. And actually, some of the stars of British politics at the moment, Nicola, Jeremy, and others, have not really yet had to take big, big decisions that alienate some of their followers and they will do so at some point. Anyway, after that reflection, if you want my answers to the mysteries, you have to come to the Edinburgh Festival, but we are gonna get now our panel and then you. So, ladies and gentlemen, Sir Ming Campbell and Yasmin Alibi-Brown. <laughs> so, thank you very much. Well, if it's okay with all of you, We'll talk now for about 15 minutes and then open it out for a discussion. So let's begin with mystery number one. I've, talked, I've kind of hinted at the Corbyn rise of Ming. Um, so could we leave Park Corbyn for a moment and begin with the stars of this festival, Nicola Sturgeon and Alex Salmond. After the referendum last September, did you anticipate at all the reaction that led to that extraordinary, as Kinnock says, bloody biblical SMP rise? Uh, Monosyllabic answer, no. Uh, a number of reasons for that. Uh, the no campaign, uh, nominally containing all three or four political parties, uh, actually had a very poor sense of unity uh, and determination. It operated on a very ad hoc basis, and there were a variety of strains and stresses within it. So once the no campaign had prevailed, uh, these separations took place again. And the most significant separation, of course, was that between the Conservatives and the Labour Party. And there were many people on the Labour side in the referendum campaign who argued very, very strongly that whatever the position, uh, they should not be in bed with the Conservatives, even if it was necessary to save the Union. And the most uh, eloquent and prominent member of that particular strain of thought was, of course, Mr. Gordon Brown, whose famous speech in the Mary Hill Town Hall uh, in Glasgow was thought by many people to turn the argument. So uh, the sense of unity of purpose uh, was very readily dissipated. The Yes campaign, on the other hand, were still together. Uh, they were marginally disappointed by not winning because an opinion poll a week out said they would, yeah, but sure. didn't. Uh, but they nonetheless felt, I suppose, a sense of grievance, and they allowed that to create a sense of purpose which the others <laughs> had long since abandoned. Uh, the other thing, too, which history will not deal kindly with David Cameron, was the morning after he went out of number 10 Downing Street, and had I been in a position of advising him, I'd have said, all you have to say is, 
people of Scotland have spoken. It, uh, it is a matter of great pleasure to me with my Scottish uh, roots that Scotland is determined to remain a member of the United Kingdom. Uh, there are a lot of problems for the United Kingdom, but united we will deal with these, whereas separately we would have not. Instead he gets out and he says, now we've done all that, we've got to get English votes yes. for English laws. What was he doing? He was playing to about 60 or 70 of his own backbenchers. And if he really was serious about the kind of constitutional change that was going to be reflected in that expression, then there was a way of doing it. You could say it's a very important decision being taken by the people of Scotland, but I, David Cameron, recognise that our constitution, our constitutional arrangements are not fit for purpose in the 21st century. And therefore, one of the things I will do is to establish a constitutional convention. I will bring people in, yes, from the, Nash, from the Scottish nationalists and the Welsh nationalists. We will have uh, a, a big discussion, a big dialogue. And out of that, I believe we will be able to create constitutional arrangements which will serve us for the foreseeable future. By failing to do that, or indeed by doing the opposite, then he gave the Yes campaign a very substantial uh, blow of wind in their sails. So th that's, uh, Yasmin, I mean, Ming has articulated very precise reasons for the surge of nationalism that followed the referendum, i.e. Cameron's totally misjudged statement it, in outside number yeah. 10. But c sorry, could I ask you some, a wider question as well? Do you think there was an energy around... You were here last I've summer. I've just written okay. this. Okay, all right, we let, talk let me about that, yeah. yeah. Um, right, I, I completely agree with uh, Ming, ex except I think it was even worse. Because what Dave did next is the problem. You know, what he showed was all of that was insincere. There was barely hidden triumphalism in his voice. And all this stuff about we're in it together was false and not believable at all because he immediately reverted. So I think what Dave did next was one reason. And I've just made a note to say once you'd raise the extraordinary, astonishing, enviable political energy that was raised in Scotland, they were not going to fall for this kind of politics ever again. And I think a lot of my Scottish friends say that they felt that they were taken as fools, they were taken as people easily manipulated by Gordon Brown, by Dave, by Nick Clegg, by everybody. And we were never going to be the fools that they thought we were. And then there was the other very important thing, and we, I hope when we come to Jeremy Corbyn, that the message that the SNP was giving, and I'm a socialist, was a message Labour never gave about equality, about justice, about the kind of sick society that has developed where we have food banks. Nicola Sturgeon and Leanne Wood gave that message, and I was on the question time just after the leaders' debate. And the one thing I felt really strongly was, oh God, I wish I lived in Scotland <laughs> or Wales because they are speaking a language. And also I have these very erotic feelings about Nicola, um, <laughs> which I I'm trying to suppress because I'm a heterosexual. But I really felt, <laughs> I really felt, you know, this is, they're speaking my language. Right, we're, we're going to cancel all other themes and um, just explore your erotic I can't tell fantasy. you what she does to me. I can't no, no. tell you. Right, really. Blimey. Oh, my okay. God. Um, <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't think, really, I can't admit to sharing the same fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I mean, Ming, do you, I mean, do you think, I mean, Yasmin's response of, how can I put it, excitement, yeah, both politically yeah. and erotically, um, <laughs> to Nicola and others. Do you agree that, fairly or unfairly, there was this perception, I felt it really strongly uh, towards the end of the referendum campaign in Scotland, that these leaders in Westminster were really all the same? Your leader then, Nick Clegg, not surprisingly, perhaps, yeah. given the <coughs> alliance with Cameron, 
And even Miliband, who actually is not politically anywhere near David Cameron, was seen as part of the same thing, and Nicola and others not. Yeah. Well, obviously, because they're all saying the same thing, which, uh, which was, don't leave the United Kingdom because the consequences in terms of economics, uh, of influence in the world, the consequences for the health service the co uh, will be dire. And if your only message is everything is going to be dire, uh, then it's not surprising uh, that people begin to think that that's all you've got to say. On the other hand, uh, the SNP, well, no, or the ref of the pro campaign, were in the wonderful position of every time anyone said how terrible the economy would be, ah, they would say, only give us full independence. We will deal with all that. Now, at one stage, they said, give us full independence. And of course, with oil at $109 a barrel, we will be able to meet all of these difficulties about food banks and all the rest of it. And the really interesting thing is that there's a kind of, I mean, it's a bit like Bill Clinton in, in many respects. Uh, the pro-independence uh, campaign is, is Teflon coated because what happens, the price of oil goes to less than $50 a barrel, drive a horse and cart through the economic plans of John Swinney, does it make any difference? No difference whatsoever. And what has happened, therefore, is that the pro-referendum, the, the pro-campaign in the referendum, and indeed the SNP, have achieved, acquired a kind of status which is very, very difficult for their opponents to puncture. Not least, of course, because their opponents are not completely united, and they don't have a single simple message. Oh, hold on. Only vote for independence. All you have to do is vote for independence. Uh, the bluebirds will sing. Uh, there will be plenty in the land, all of that. Now, I, I think it's wholly, wholly uh, false and fictitious. But at the moment, at least, people, because of their determination to look for something else, and this really goes back towards Corbyn, are willing to invest their uh, political interest in something of that kind. They're looking for an idea from outside. And here's an idea which, no matter many imperfections people like me point out, nonetheless appears to transcend anything else that's being said. Yeah. I just wanted to say that's not fair, actually. I don't think that's fair because there has been this buy-in by every government we've had since Margaret Thatcher that there is this one economic model that this is the only thing that works economically and politically. Two Cambridge economists, whose names I can't remember, two weeks ago produced a book and a paper, an academic paper, which looked at some of the orthodoxies about the economic model, starting with Margaret Thatcher saved the economy, saved this country from being a basket case. They have proved, as economists, that actually, after the Thatcher so-called revolution, uh, pr productivity plummeted. That a lot of things that were taken for granted as the way, the only way, are actually false emperor's clothes. Now, what's very interesting is I don't think the SNP leadership just talked in these terms well, that you've described. They offered a slightly more Scandinavian model, a different oh, model. But, but, but and but, I think but, that's important. Right, but if you want a Scandinavian well, model... We must move on. If you want yeah. Scand there's a very interesting uh, parallel, very interesting illustration, because a, lo a lot of people are arguing for yes, and they're saying, we need a Scandinavian model. Like, for example, Norway. Well, that's very interesting. Norway has a higher cost of living, with the sole exception of Switzerland, of any other country in the world. If you wish to see a GP in Norway, it's a wonderful, wonderful health service, you have to pay about 18 or 20 pounds a time. If you want to see a consultant, you have to pay about 30 pounds a time. And so the notion somehow that these external opportunities and external examples were entirely consistent with what was being offered here simply doesn't stand okay. up to scrutiny. Right, so we're in danger of rehearsing again the uh, independence debate. I mean, it might be well rehearsed again if there's a second referendum, but we won't go there. Could I ask you, I'll ask you something about the uh, Corbyn surge. Just briefly, because I, I didn't mention, and I, I don't want to spend too much time on it because you've almost been wiped out with every respect, but the, the Lib Dem collapse, did, did you anticipate that? No, no, no one did. Um, although I'm not, uh, as, as it were, part of the high command, 
Uh, I happen to know that there were plans afoot to see whether or not it might be necessary to form another coalition. Yeah, right. And the basis upon which we would do that, we would have been a lot more hard-headed than we had been previously. There would have been very careful determination not to make pledges in <coughs> advance or during the election campaign, which would come home to bite us for the next five years. All of that was in hand. And I don't think anywhere, anyone anticipated that we would do quite so badly. One last point because you, before you pass over to Yasmin, and it's this. We're used to living off scorched earth. 1959, when I went to university, I joined the Liberal Party as it then was. I think it had six MPs. Yeah. And as someone said to me once, well, that was a very, that was a very well-intentioned uh, political judgment, career path to, put, to map out for yourself. We have uh, gone from relative poverty to relative affluence. We're capable of doing that again, 10 years minimum, probably. But we're in it for the long haul. But I think we will have something to say which will be relevant to a section of the political community which, if Corbyn is elected, will find difficulty in continuing their association with the Labour Party. Mm. Yeah, no, someone, when I was in Edinburgh, uh, shopping at Waitrose, I was mobbed by one person who said, Lucky you. do you think <laughs> the crisis in the Labour Party could lead to the revival of your party because of people, but anyway, who, that's perhaps leaping a barrier or two, um, but I was thrilled to be mobbed with that question. Uh, so Yasmin, the Corbyn phenomenon, is that the energy that you identify, the erotic charge that you feel towards Nicola. Some have felt the same, they say, towards Jeremy. No, I don't Jeremy. feel that about Jeremy. Oh, ask, oh, well. He's biblical. He's, yeah. um, you know, so, John the Baptist, but um, really. So, so what, what, like what do you there? think? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but is it, is it part, you identified a hunger for an alternative economic model, a more yes. Scandinavian model. Is the Corbyn thing, although actually he's not a Swedish social democrat, um, is that part of the same kind of hunger that you identified in Scotland or, or something Well, there's something similar different? happening, but I think one has to remember, and this is what's wrong with the other candidates. Um, my husband used to live with Jeremy Corbyn's um, uh, political assistant 25 years ago, and he tells these wonderful stories of literally Tamils under the bed hidden because the police were looking for them and the IRA locked in cupboards and so on. So he's had an exciting life, uh, which has <laughs> this a very... Is Jeremy, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, Corbyn, you know, yes, uh, which doesn't make him... I, I personally would not vote for him if I had the vote or I, or I had the, was part of the process. But I do think that one has to remember something that the other leaders have forgotten, that only 36% of the British population voted the Tories in. Are you only going to talk to them? Are you not going to talk to all the others who either didn't vote or actually don't like the single model that has been taken up by the coalition government and Labour? There are so many of us, and I include myself, who are, are not part of this 36%, and I think he's brought in some of those people, which is a great thing, he's excited them. And, you know, I find the smear campaigns against him so shocking, actually. How did this country begin to have such dirty politics? So I've defended him against those smears. I don't think he's, he's going to win the next election, but I think he's speaking to those people the other parties are not speaking to south of the border. Could he help uh, Labour revive in Scotland? I mean, I gather he... Uh, last week addressed a huge meeting in Glasgow and then had to go outside to address many more hundreds in a way that kind of had echoes with uh, Nicola Sturgeon and Alex Salmond, you know, that he kind of regener revived a kind of energy in the Labour Party. I mean, could he, at the very least, help Labour in Scotland or not, do you think? I think, um, he, I think he could, but it would depend on whether... Uh, Joanne Lamont's reason for her resignation as Labour leader uh, is recognised when she said the problem is that in Scotland the Labour Party is regarded as a branch office of London. And unless and until the Labour Party is able to assert, if not uh, constitutionally but certainly culturally, a complete and absolute distinction from what happens 
the Labour Party in, in England, then I think it's very, very difficult for them to make progress. Uh, there's no doubt that what uh, Jeremy Corbyn has to say is very attractive. Uh, I mean, I think it's very attractive in two, in two respects. First of all, to young people, Und understandably that. And why, of course, because we all know the generation of younger people are having it harder, looking around the number of probably than any of the rest of us in this room. Uh, tuition fees, uh, the problem of getting a job, uh, that kind of thing, disappointment. Uh, and the other group of people, the people who never really settled with Tony Blair. They're the people who in the 70s and the 80s sought to continue, I suppose you would argue, or at least uh, propagate Tony Ben, uh, Benism and uh, principles of that kind. And these two have come together. And they come together quite remarkably in a way which Corbyn has been able to utilize. But the interesting thing about Corbyn is this. People talk about him as a figure of unity. It's a man who <laughs> voted against his own party on 500 occasions. Good. I mean, Good. why? Well, he says, as, and I don't doubt it for a moment, because as it happens, I rather like him. And we've talked to each other from time to time in those comments about, about Israel and the Palestinians. And although I don't agree with the language he's used, nonetheless, I recognize the fact that he's argued the case for the Palestinians enormously eloquently. But his whole approach has been not let's have unity of purpose, but rather let me as a member of parliament have the right to exercise my judgment and vote against my own party. On that basis, it's quite difficult to see how he is going to create round about him a sense of unity of purpose. Yeah. Now, if you're right about that, and you're right that it's going to take your party 10 years mm. to really rebuild, and you say he can't win a general election, Let's go to that final third, and then we're going to open up for questions very briefly, please, so we need to get to some questions. Um, do you work on the assumption that the Conservative Party at Westminster are in for 10 years? If he can't win the next election, Ming's party won't revive quickly? Well, it is my fear. But you know, there are only 12. They've got a 12 majority. Tiny. So I'm hoping for some, something, the gods to intervene. 12 is not a lot. Um, but the other thing is, I, I, I think what Jeremy Corbyn has done is inject another set of values, another set of political priorities. Um, and you know, the Blairites are terrified of him, absolutely so terrified of him, that the kind of camp these dirty campaigns are part of it. So I think to, I want to live in a country, as do most people, where there are genuine political choices, not where there's one kind of gray lump and that's the only thing. And so personalities are what people vote for. And I, I do think that's important. So he will have an influence. I mean, to hear, you know, Andy Burnham moves with the wind, um, there was one moment when he said, come join me, Jeremy. And I thought that was quite good because at least he'll influence the party. We don't, we need some socialism back. Okay. We need it. And, and just briefly, before we are, uh, open on, it to on, question, on, 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 on 10 years of the Conservative well, at Westminster. Ah, uh, there's a referendum on Europe coming down yeah. the track. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And to my uh, well, belief, rather, my certain knowledge, certainly in the last parliament, there were 60 or 80 Conservative MPs who would rather be out of government than in Europe. Uh, and if David Cameron is unable to come back with a credible package as a result well, he may come back with a credible package, but actually it doesn't matter how credible it is, those 60 MPs will not be satisfied with anything other than capitulation. You know, the uh, assassination of Mr. Juncker, uh, the tearing up of the Treaty of Rome, even that, even that, that, red, even that red blood would, would, would not satisfy them. Yeah. And therefore it's not beyond the bounds of possibility that there would be a very substantial crisis within the Conservative Party if, for example, what is brought back uh, does not command universal support on the Tory benches, and if, for example, the referendum is answered, yes, we should leave. Great. That well, would be a major crisis for the Conservatives, for the country, in my view, as well, but certainly for David Cameron. So we've covered the three kind of mysteries, the rise of Corbyn, the extraordinary rise of the SNP after losing a referendum, and Cameron winning, and now questions. Yeah, over there, please. And then. Oh, sorry, yeah, there are mics, thanks. 
So uh, at the moment, there's a lot of uh, talk in the press about the existence or potential existence of two one-party states either side of the border between England and Scotland. Um, in the event that Corbyn does not manage to rally the Labour Party, where do you see the, the viable opposition to the Conservative government in the South and the SNP government here coming from? And Good do question. you think there's a chance of, uh, of some sp split in the next three years in either of those parties, al either along EU lines or economic lines and uh, fiscal lines in Scotland? Okay, Yasmin, if you deal with Labour, do you think there is a possibility of a split like the SDP in the 80s? I certainly think that if uh, Jeremy Corbyn wins, yes, and it'll be just as stupid and just as lost a cause as the SDB was. Um, but what I think, uh, in the end, it was. It, it led to nothing. And I really admired jo Roy Jenkins, Shirley Williams. They are amazing people. But actually, it was a lost cause. I, I really wish uh, Lib Dems had done better. Um, the revival of the Lib Dems, because I just don't think that this party now, the way Labour is, and certainly the way it's carried on in the last two weeks, has brought me out in a rash of confidence. Um, so maybe we will need a new party. Maybe there has got to be a complete rethink about what the opposition is going to be. Um, and within Tories, I know I'm not supposed, there are good Tories who hate, for example, what the, what the present government is doing to migrants. I know that for a fact because they, they've talked to me. They feel ashamed that this is the reaction. And some of them are pro-business, if nothing else, for that reason. So we can't predict anything. But I certainly don't think that a Labour, the Labour Party as is or will be for the next year. OK. Uh, if you could follow through your Europe uh, analysis, which is potentially explosive. If there are 80 or so who want out and will be unhappy with Cameron's renegotiation, do you think it is possible that the Tory party might split? Well, the Conservative Party has a very strong disinclination uh, to give up power because they see themselves as a natural party of government. Uh, and on that basis, I think there will be a lot of forces within which would try to ensure uh, that there wasn't a split. However, we've talked for about 40 minutes and we haven't mentioned Mr. Nigel Farage. Uh, Mr. Farage could easily be the focus round which the campaign to come out much. He rather wants to do it. I think there are strenuous efforts being made to try and get other people to do it, particularly a non-political figure. But he will most certainly have very considerable influence on the outcome. Do you think Britain might vote to pull out of Europe? It's possible. I but I, it's well, possible. let me put it this way. I sure as hell hope it isn't, yeah. because the consequences would be, I mean, I, I think one has to be careful about saying how catastrophic the consequences would be. But I just ask you to think, uh, by way of parallel, supposing Scotland voted for independence, how long and how much would it cost to disentangle the union which we have and we call the United Kingdom? Supposing the United Kingdom voted to leave the European Union, how long and how much would it cost to disentangle Britain from the European Union? What would the consequences be, for example, for the bond market, the financial market, uh, for the stability of the pound? Absolutely enormous in every case, uh, well, either case. And that's the reason why I hope most fervently uh, that we don't. And can one, okay. one, one very last briefly, because we're on Very, very quick point, and it's this. People say that Europe should not be political. They, yeah. say, they say it should be economic only. But there are changes in Europe uh, or outside of Europe which make it absolutely essential that there should be a political direction and a cohesive political policy. And that is reflected by the policies of Mr. Putin and a more assertive and more resurgent Russia. The only way you can have sanctions which cause any effect and the only way you can bind the Germans into these sanctions is by doing it through the European Union. Otherwise, Mr. Putin would just pick country off one by one by one. And that's why a political dimension to Europe is absolutely fundamental. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, there and then, Mark, and then, yeah.
Uh, <clears throat> in British political uh, history of general elections, um, there has never been such a large percentage of voters who voted for parties who were not going to form government. Um, it's doubtful that that is going to be repeated next time round. The question of Jeremy Corbyn as being unelectable next time round uh, may only arise uh, because the other candidates don't look particularly electable next time round either. either. And uh, if it may seem a little bit of a generational uh, statement, but I think Ming's generation um, was far superior in its intellectual genuine self-confidence and capability to handle the political issues of being um, leading natural parties of government. Uh, and I don't think that is true of, um, of the current generation. And okay. Uh, uh, just you. very quickly. Yeah. Um, the UK, um, Scotland is 8% of the UK economy. The UK, however, is 15% of Europe. Um, so uh, just as the issues for Scotland, as Ming has just said, the issues for Europe, uh, of the UK and Europe are far greater consequence than uh, the general debate has even begun. Begun to even recognise. Thank you. You, you want to, could you yeah. respond briefly? Because yeah, we've got very to try and fit three I, more I questions. Just, the, if, if Britain decides to leave the European Union, the Scots will decide to leave the Union, and I can completely see why, because they're very good Europeans. But uh, the, the, the point I make, well, they are, they are, they are. If you move, you know, if, if our country, if the country is there, that'll be another impetus. I don't want them to, but I'm saying, but I don't, I just don't agree. I really respect Ming and I've liked him all these years. But I think it's a bit arrogant to say that there isn't a generation capable of doing this job. They will do it in a different way. The establishment, the political establishment, has had its day, has had its say. We need, I know this country doesn't do revolutions, I only wish it did sometimes, but um, there's got to be a change. You cannot assume that the old way of doing things, and I am the same age as Ming, and I get more revolutionary as the time goes on, actually. Thank you very much. Um, let's bring some more questions. To, yeah, Mark. Well, I, I just want to thank Ming for being here tonight. Um, he is one of our patrons and Beyond Borders has grown over the years um, and it's because of the people like Ming who have lent their name. Ming, I just wanted to ask you this question. You are one of our greatest parliamentarians of the age and what are your most extraordinary memories of Parliament over the last two or three decades? I mean, what st stands out for you? Um, and on what's it like? I know you may or may not be heading back there, but what what stands out for you and what was it like finally leaving that extraordinary national forum of which you played such a great part? Uh, two, the defenestration of Margaret Thatcher and yeah. uh, second, the occasion when, and this is rather self-serving, but the Liberal Democrat Party as a whole went into the lobby to vote against Tony Blair on Iraq. Accompanied, if I may say so. <laughs> Accompanied, if I may say so, that uh, a great friend of mine and I think a uh, massive political figure, Robin Cook, who of course resigned. Uh, uh, Claire, well, uh, Claire got round to it eventually, but Robin, <laughs> wrote, it's true, but Robin did it and was tear stained in the lobby. And the way in which I mean, this goes back to the point I made about the Conservatives think they're the party of government because what was called the poll tax had begun after its disastrous experiment in Scotland to be seen in England as standing in the way of the re-election of many Conservative members of Parliament. And if you want one thing to concentrate the minds of MPs, it is the fact that they may find themselves no longer in the House of Commons. And the swiftness with which that occurred, absolutely extraordinary. Yes. The cabinet, one after another, Malcolm Rifkin, Kenneth Clark, people like that lining up to say, Luke, you've got to go. This is someone who, what, only what, two years before, won yet another general election and very handsomely. And that, I think, was absolutely staggering. And on Iraq, perhaps not so much the vote, uh, although, I, again, to be clear, Kenneth Clark and people like that actually came into the lobby with us as well. Uh, but the aftermath, 
which went on for, and God help us, is still going on in the shape of Chilcot, um, but which, on, which went on, on and on and on, to a point now where Jeremy Corbyn's going to say Labour is going to apologise for Iraq. I understand, and that's a perfectly rational thing to do. But you can't, you cannot find a single person in the House of Commons <coughs> now who justifies the decision to take that military action. So you have the defenestration of this extraordinary figure. Uh, Thatcher, and you now have the trashing of the reputation of this extraordinary figure, Blair. Blair won three consecutive majorities in three consecutive elections, 160, 160, and 60. And guess, uh, guess what, when you're talking about Scotland, on every occasion, he got a majority of the votes cast and of the members of parliament returned, from Sco returned for Scotland. So whatever Scotland may be thinking now, there's no doubt on these three occasions, it was willing to support Mr. Blair, and by implication, Blairism as well. Okay, uh, we've got time for one more question. We're sorry, we, we're out, I'm really sorry. We're out, yeah. Uh, Ming, I'd like to pay the compliment of using the word about you as being a statesman. And I, <laughs> would, I would like to ask you... It's better than veteran, which is <laughs> more frequently. Well, <laughs> no, but you have intellect, wisdom, pragmatism. Looking at the House of Commons now, do you see future statesmen or do you merely see politicians and puppets? Well, if you could keep I'll, I'll, up, I'll ask both yes, keep it brief. Yes. Because we're I'll be very, very quick. Um, and I'll tell you what I do. I go back to Harold Wilson and to Dennis Healy and to Richard Crossman and Tony Crossland, uh, Crossland and Roy Jenkins and Barbara Castle. Mm. And I say, it's, if you think about the Labour leadership potential contest, an actual contest, in that time of the life of this parliament, then I think it's very hard to argue uh, that those who currently seek these responsibilities measure up to what was a quite extraordinary um, collection uh, of people. I think the problem is very simply this. When I first got in in 1987, there were Knights of the Shires, um, Sir Tufton Beamish, people like that. There were trade unionists. They had one thing in common. They'd almost all fought in the war, sometimes together. Uh, and they had a kind of shared experience, <coughs> and their ambition was to represent their constituents. Now I'm afraid to say people go into the House of Commons with their ambition to be the, the Under Secretary of State for widgets or um, animal husbandry or, or something of that kind. And what has happened, for whatever reason I don't really uh, uh, pretend to understand, is that to go into Parliament now is to, is to be seen as a profession in which you're a failure if you don't rise to the top. 1987, that wasn't the case. I'm okay. afraid it is now. And Yasmin, you, in general terms, challenged that assumption. Yeah, so totally. can you name any individual? Stella if Creasy. I think we should be really careful when we kind of get older not to recognise that change was much needed. It was a white middle-class male club of people who had shared... The Westminster Party. Westminster Party. It needed shaking up. And I think we have very good people in Parliament. I think what's happened in the last few years is the Men Mandelson effect, the kind of horribleness of control and spinning and all of that. But no, you know the Khalil Gibran poem, these young people live in the house of tomorrow. I want to give them the chance. I like it, it's a more diverse uh, group of people. I don't want that past. I really don't. Okay, Brilliant. thank you. Well, thank you for listening. Thank you to this wonderful panel. Who knows where we'll be in a year's time? Thank you all very much indeed. I'm thank in you. Scotland. I'm moving to, <laughs> moving to Scotland. Scotland. We're all moving to Scotland. <laughs>